Uh, now we're going to be looking at our continuation of the Song of Solomon. And I, those of you that have been coming realize it's a whole nother look at Solomon than maybe you have anticipated before. But let's open with a, a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you again so much for your word. Every, every single jot and tittle is so important. Every single letter, every word is so important. Father, I pray that you would work within each one of us a strong desire to really be Bereans, to really study, to show ourselves approved. Father, that we would have uh, such a thirst for your word. Father, that we would uh, just be driven. Uh, so often as we're so driven to fulfill the lust of the flesh, Father, I pray you would use that drive and that we would be driven to understand you more, that we would run toward you. We just thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now, one of the things that we've talked about is the daughters of Jerusalem. Who are the daughters of Jerusalem? Do you guys remember who the daughters of Jerusalem are? It's, it's the suburbs. It's Sodom. It'd be Gomorrah. It'd be Samaria. We saw that in the last week uh, in Ezekiel. Uh, the, the daughters are going to be the suburbs. And we saw in Ezekiel how God said he's going to give Sodom and uh, Samaria to Jerusalem four daughters. Now, one of the things uh, that we can think of this is... Th- Solomon, if you remember, married someone from all the nations practically, okay? So think of the daughters of Jerusalem as Solomon's harem, okay? So when you're hearing the daughters of Jerusalem, you're you're thinking of Solomon's harem. Now, what we saw last week, uh, the shepherd has rescued uh, his love from the castle and brought her to his place. I see the shepherd and the king in chapter 1 as two different people. Uh, she knows who the king is. She knows where he lives. And yet, in chapter 1, she talks to a shepherd and has no clue about where he feeds. And so I see them as two different people, and you're going to see uh, why more as we go here. But last week, we saw how the shepherd uh, rescued her from the castle and has taken her now to his place. And we see, uh, last week, we closed with this verse on your notes, uh, chapter 1, verse 15 through 17. Where, if we remember, he always refers to her as what? My love. And she always refers to him as my beloved. So here we see he's speaking and he says, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. So he sees her with dove's eyes, not hawk's eyes or some eagle eye, you know. uh, But innocent, pure, undefiled, gentle, harmless. And where's he looking? Directly in her eyes. And yet, uh, what is her response to him? She goes, behold, you're fair too, my beloved, pleasant. But look at this. Our bed is green. The beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are of fur. So he is consumed with her. But what is she consumed with? The possessions, the stuff, which is so much like the bride of Messiah today. We get more consumed with the possessions, with what we have, more than we do with the Messiah. In Matthew six twenty eight through 30, the Lord makes a direct relation back to Solomon. And he says uh, to the people he's speaking to, why do you worry about clothing? Then he said, consider the lilies of the field. OK, so when when we look at this, as far as a parallel, he's comparing them to what? Lilies, Right. And he says, look how they grow. They don't toil or spend. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Then he says, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So he's comparing them to lilies. Does everyone get that? Now, as a matter of fact, uh, we're going to see this more in a few weeks here, but I want to bring this in. In Song of Solomon 6, 1 and 2, the daughters of Jerusalem are speaking to her, and she says, where is your beloved gone? Most beautiful among women, where has your beloved turned? For we seek him along with you. Now, see, this is prophetic of the last days when all the nations are going to be turning toward the Lord, this great harvest, and they're now going to be seeking the father, just like uh, 10 Gentiles from every nation are going to be grabbing the seat seat of the Jew. We want to go where God is with you. So this is prophetic of that time. And they're saying, we want to seek him along with you. And then what does she say? She says, my beloved has gone down into his garden to the beds of spices to feed in the gardens and to do what? So what is he symbolically saying? 
He's gone down to the garden. He's feeding on the lilies. He's harvesting souls, basically. He's gathering lilies, the people that, that believe in him. Is everyone getting the connection here? If you remember in chapter 1, she didn't have any idea where he feeds. Now she at least knows where he feeds. Now let's look at how many of you realize Israel was set apart from the rest of the nations, right? God set Israel apart. So all the nations are as lilies. Israel is going to be the lily of all the lilies. Now watch this in Hosea 14. Hosea, the whole book is tied right into the Song of Solomon. Look at what he says. Oh, Israel, return to the Lord, your God. You have fallen by your iniquity. I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from him. I will be as the dew. You're going to find that term very significant here in a few chapters, a couple of weeks from now. But he says, I will be as the dew to Israel. And Israel will grow as what? As the lily and cast out his roots like Lebanon. So he's saying you're going to be like a lily, but also in one sense like a fir tree from Lebanon that's going to spread out its roots all over the place. But here we see Israel is called the lily. Do you see that? Now the reason why I said all of that is to bring you to this next verse because so many people misinterpret this next verse. In Song of Solomon 2, chapter 1, it says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. A lot of people attribute that to the Messiah, but no, it refers to Israel. This is the Shulamite who was saying, I am the rose of Sharon, a lily in the valley. So Israel is represented as the rose of Sharon and as a particular lily in the valleys. Now, when it says the rose of Sharon, what does that mean? Well, let's look at Isaiah 35 too. Then I'm going to show you some pictures. It talks about how it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. I think it's interesting here in Matthew 6, it was talking about how Solomon and in in all of his glory didn't compare because they were looking at Solomon and all of his glory, thinking of that. But he's saying, look, what are they going to see? The glory of the Lord. Now, let's talk a little bit about Sharon. Do you know where that is and where Carmel is? So let me show you on a map. Okay, here is uh, Carmel. Uh, Mount Carmel is right here. This is the ridge. Here's where Elijah went down and got water and destroyed the prophets of Baal. And right here is the Sharon Plain. Okay, right in here. And what's the main city in the Sharon Plain? Caesarea. Okay, so we're going to look at the Sharon Plain here. And what's interesting is prophetically, see, this is like a desert. I don't know how many of you have been to Israel, but it's like a desert. But here's talking about in the last days it's going to blossom like a rose and do all these things. Here are some pictures of some of the flowers from Sharon from two years ago. And let me see where I'm going to go to. Eight. That one's kind of pretty. Another nice one. Yes. Okay. Okay, that's a mallow. There's another beautiful flower. These are all from pictures from Israel. It's truly blossoming like a rose. Okay, now, <clears throat> let's look at this, what it goes on to say. In Isaiah 65.10, now this is going to be key as we study the Song of Solomon. Look at what it says here. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks in the valley of Achor, a place for the herds to lie down in. For my people that have done what? What does he want us to do? To seek him. Now, what's fascinating about Caesarea, remember I showed you on the map Caesarea. I don't know if you have any, how many of you have ever been there. But it talks about in Acts 10.24, it was at Caesarea that Cornelius lived. Remember the whole story of Acts 10 and the sheep coming down? That's where Cornelius lived. And in Acts 21, 8, look at what it says. This is, says, the next day we that were of Paul's company departed, came to Caesarea. We entered into the house of who? Philip the Evangelist. So this is where Philip the Evangelist lived. So we're seeing right there prophetically back then even, there were many lilies of the valley that were being gathered up. That Paul was there in prison for a couple of years as well. Here's a few pictures of Caesarea, that area when I was there with Vicky, some others from here. This is a, like a Roman uh, theater 
that was there right on the coast of Caesarea. And you'll notice here, this is also where they did the chariot races. Uh, this was one of the signs. It says the uh, chariot races thrilled the crowds. It was a counterclockwise seven-lap race. It uh, commenced at the starting gates, ended at the finish line, which is at the front of the Dignitaries' Tribune. And at each end of the uh, rib, there were two turning points, and their sharp curves posed a major challenge to the skilled charioteers and the galloping horses. And here's a picture of that. People would sit along here, and this dirt here area is where it was. And here's a, another picture of how long it was. But you'll notice it faces the Mediterranean. So here are all these people. What a gorgeous view. they got to sit, watch the chariot races. Here's a, a more gorgeous distant view. Here's where they would have been. Here's the, where that one thing was I showed you. And then here's where the chariot races were. And they would have all been sitting around here watching the chariot races. It, it was a gorgeous area. But this is what's blooming and blossoming. Look at all the trees and everything there. And that's just sunset when Vicky and I were there that we took that picture. It's a beautiful place. But that is Sharon. That's where that area is. And so now let's look at how the shepherd responds. And you're going to see why this definitely refers to her, where she says, I'm the lily of the valleys. Look at how he responds. He says, well, as the lily is among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. So he's saying, my love, you are a lily and you're around a bunch of what? Thorns, which is referring to the Gentiles. And uh, look at Mark 4, 18 and 19. Here he's talked about these are they which are what? Sown among thorns. They're the ones that hear the word, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. Remember, Solomon was very wealthy. The lust of other things entered in. They choke the word until it becomes what? Unfruitful. And so when we think about uh, those sowed among thorns, you want to go back to the Hebrew Scriptures so you can get a better idea. As a matter of fact, that very verse in Mark directly relates back to Jeremiah, chapter 4, verse 3, where it says, Thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and do what? Sow not among thorns. So that's what he was talking about. You need to be careful about where you plant yourself. And then we find uh, in Song of Solomon 2, 3, <clears throat> here is what she says. He just got to saying to her, you're like a lily among thorns. And then she responds back uh, to the daughters of Jerusalem. She's speaking to them. And she says, as the apple is among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. And then she says, I sat down under his shadow with great delight and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Well, I think what's fascinating is, does a lily produce fruit? Do fir trees produce fruit? Okay, look at Hosea again, 14, 8 and 9. Ephraim's going to say, what have I to do anymore with idols? I've heard him and watched him. I am like a green fir tree. And then you see God interject. Your fruit is found from who? That's right. Who is wise and who's going to understand these things? Understanding he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. Now, this is what's interesting about the ways of the Lord. Look at this. The just are going to walk in them, but the sinners are going to fall in them. It's the same path for both, but some stumble and fall, and some it's the way to walk. And in Galatians 5, everyone's familiar with verse 22 and 23, where it talks about the fruit of who? So it's not our fruit. We're just the branches, and the branches just are we're to be producing fruit, okay? But it's not our fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit that's flowing through us. And we saw that she wanted to sit under his shadow. And we see in Psalms 91, 1, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And in Psalms 34, 8, we see where it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. And then finally, in Psalms 119, 103, it says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And so here we see she is saying how under his shadow she finds the light and his fruit was sweet to my taste. But it, look at what this goes on to say, though. The Shulamite is continuing to talk to the daughters of Jerusalem and look what she says to them. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. And then she says this. This is quite fascinating when you go and look up these words and find where these words are associated with. She says, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. 
And then notice this. It says, his left hand is under my head and his right hand does embrace me. Now, let me ask you something. If his left hand is under her head, who is laying down? She is. Okay? She's the one that's laying down. But now let's uh, look at a couple of things. She said, his banner over me was love. And in Psalm 60, verse 4, it says, you have given what? A banner to those who fear you to lift up because of the truth. But look at Hosea 3, 1 through 5. He loved her, but she says, stay be with flagons. And the word stay there basically means to prop up or support. Look at what it says in Hosea. Then said the Lord to me, you go and love a woman beloved of her friend, yet she's an adulteress. According to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. And so look at what it says here. He says, so I bought her for how many pieces of silver? Now, didn't God already own her? Didn't he already redeem her? And yet here he's talking about purchasing her again for 15 pieces of silver and for an omer of barley and a half an omer of barley. See, barley is worthless compared to wheat. I mean, in value there. And it says, and I said unto her, you shall abide for me many days and you shall not play the harlot. Okay, a harlot is purchased. And here he's saying, okay, I'm going to purchase her. And because I bought you, I own you here now. And so you can't play the harlot with anyone else. You're mine. And then this is prophetic about the days that we're living in right now. Look at what it says. And you shall not be for another man, so will I also be for you. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, without teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So the time they've been 2000 years now without those things. But fascinating is he's talking about these latter days, how they're going to repent and return to the Lord. Now, how many shekels of silver did he buy her for? Look at what it says in Exodus 21, 32. If an ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant... He shall give unto their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. So the slave was valued at 30 shekels of silver. She's fallen below the value of a slave. In Isaiah 43, verse 3 and 4, it says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since you were precious in my sight, you've been honorable, and I have loved you. Therefore will I give men for you and people for your life. But now that they've gone a whoring from him, he will give but 15 pieces of silver for them. So much have they lost in their value by their iniquity. Isn't that fascinating when you look at what was paid compared to what she was originally worth? And then we find she falls asleep. Isn't that typical of the church today? And so now what happens, she falls asleep, and then the shepherd is now going to speak to the daughters of Jerusalem. And in chapter 2, verse 7, look at what he says. Now this is now remember again, who was laying down? If you look in your Bible, I can guarantee you almost every one of your Bibles are mistranslated here. You're going to find some of them are correctly translated. In... Song of Solomon 2, seven it says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, you stir not up nor awake my love till she please. You look in your Bibles, they all say he please. Almost every one of your Bibles are going to say he please, but it's an inaccurate translation of the Hebrew. When he, she calls him my beloved, he calls her my love. And here he sings, stir not up nor awake my love till she please look it up in your strong's concordance even even if you look up in your strong's you'll see it's supposed to be she we all know in psalms 121 4 that he that keeps israel will neither what god will not slumber or sleep who does sleep his people okay and so uh just in case you didn't know but any of you that want to check it out you can check it out and see that it is correct it's supposed to be she <clears throat> now here the shulamite all of a sudden awakes and she speaks. So here she's been, this also shows you how it's she is the one that is asleep because he comes over telling her to get up. So that's another good clue that she was the one that was sleeping. And we see in Song of Solomon 2, 
verse 8 through 10, she says, the voice of my beloved. Behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he stands behind her wall. He looks forth at the window, showing himself through the lattice. And then she says, my beloved spoke and said unto me. So now we're seeing a transition and he's speaking. And what does he say? Get up. But he's nice. He's gentle. He's not yelling. Get up. He's just saying, rise up, my love. This is how you know he's the one that's talking. My fair one and come away for lo. What does he say here? The what? She didn't sleep for one night. She went into hibernation, guys. My gosh, the winter is over. Okay, and when it says the rain is over and gone, the rains in the Bible always speak of blessings. She's missed out on the rains. She's missed out on all the blessings. And he's saying, hey, it's time to get up. He says the flowers are appearing on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig trees putting forth her green frig, figs. And the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. And then again, he says, arise, my love. So again, this tells you she's the one that was asleep. He says, and come away, O my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. He says, let me see your countenance. Let me hear your voice, for sweet is your voice. And your countenance is comely. And then he says, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Now I'm going to begin to give you a greater understanding of this whole context of what he's saying here. First off, we know from Proverbs 10, 5, he that gathers in summer is a wise son, but he that sleeps in harvest is a son that causes shame. So here she's been sleeping all through the winter, and he's saying spring is coming. It's going to be time for the barley harvest, the wheat harvest. You don't want to be sleeping in harvest. And so the last page here. In Jeremiah 8, 7, very significant. Remember we just talked about the turtle dove? you know, is singing. Look at Jeremiah 8, 7. It says, Yea, the stork in the heavens know her appointed times. They know the moades. The stork in heaven knows God's appointed times. That's Why do you think they birds migrate like they do? There's something inside. They just know it's time to go. And it says, And the turtle dove and the swallow and the crane observe the time of their coming, but my people don't know the law of Jehovah. He says, the animals, they instinctively know the appointed times. They know when to come. But my people don't know. They don't understand the appointed times. They're missing the festivals the, and the harvest and all these things. In Jeremiah 8, 20 through 22, see, this is about the destruction of the temple. And what does it say? The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. God says, for the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. Remember, that's a direct correlation back to when she said she was black in uh, chapter one. She says, astonishment, or he says, astonishment has taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? So he's wanting her not to miss the harvest, gathering lilies, saving people. And then again, here's a reference in Jeremiah concerning the latter days. Remember, she was, he said, I want to see you. I want to hear you. Come out of the secret places. Look at what it says here. There's two points here I want to make that you're going to see here. In Jeremiah 23, 20 through 24, the anger of the Lord shall not return until he has executed, until he has performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. Now look at what it says. This is something that's going to happen in the latter days. How many of you know there are a lot of prophets running around today? How many of you know many of them are false prophets? Matter of fact, in Jeremiah's day, I think, you know, it was like, one to 99, like one good prophet for 99 false prophets. And I think that's probably still the statistic today. Look what God says. I've not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had understood, but if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. The purpose of a prophet is not to tell you the next great event happening. The purpose of a prophet is to get you to repent. And then it says this, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God far off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord? The Lord says, you can't hide anywhere. And here she's trying to hide, but she's hiding in his house of all things. She's in the house and she's hiding. And he's outside. Remember, he was standing outside of the door looking in the window and saying, Come out. I want you to work the harvest with me. 
But look at what she says here in Song of Solomon 2, 16 and 17. I didn't put here that she's the one speaking on the notes, but she's the one that's speaking here. She says, my beloved is mine. And I am his. In other words, God, you belong to me first and then I belong to you. She doesn't say I belong to my beloved and he is mine, but I, uh, my beloved is mine. In other words, God, I'm going to pull you. You belong to me. I'll pull you out of my pocket when I need you. So see, you're going to see this phrase. It's turned around. Later on, she reverses this. And then later on, she changes it again. But right now, her attitude is my beloved is mine and I am his. He feeds among the lilies. Chapter one, she didn't know where he fed. And now she realizes where he feeds. But look at what her comment is then. She says, until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and you be like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. In other words, he's at the door outside calling her to get up. And she says, why don't you go take off? I want you to turn. I'm not going to turn. You turn upon the mountains of Bether. In Hebrew, the word Bether means mountains of division or cutting off. It's like the the cascades cutting off one side from the other side. So she's telling him, why don't you take a hike? Why don't you go do your thing and work to harvest? I'm going to just sit in this beautiful house of the Lord and be blessed. And so guess what happens? He does. He leaves. And so all of a sudden now in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, she says this. This is her speaking. Now, remember also last week I told you she was saying, and I showed you on the notes the very first verse, it was our bed and our house. Look how it's changed in 3, 1 and 2. By night on my bed. It's no longer our bed. It's now my bed. She says, I sought him. So here she is laying on bed. I can just see her waving her arm trying to think, why didn't he come back to me? Doesn't he love me? Why? Where is he? He's not in bed. And so she says, I sought him whom my soul loves. She professes to love him. And then she says again, I sought him, but I found him not. Then she says, okay, I'm going to get up now. And go about the city in the streets and in the what? The broad ways. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. So here we see this. This bride-to-be who professes to love him, but it's on whose terms? This is uh, quite fascinating, this word love. I mean, I I say I love my wife and I love hot dogs. Well, kosher hot dogs. Anyway, but it's quite fascinating how, you know, with one, I can use that same word to say I also love the Mariners and I also love this and I also love that. How many of you know the word love has been so totally just trashed almost. We don't even know what it means.